The Mass Grave In September 2022, a mass burial site was discovered in Izium, Ukraine. And shockingly, it wasn't even the first one found. Prior to the mass grave at Izium, others were discovered in Bucha and Mariupol. They were the result of alleged war crimes that were carried out by the Russians. And the mass burial site found in September contained roughly 440 graves. Authorities uncovered the bodies of mostly civilians, many of whom appeared to have been tortured before they were killed. Chief investigator Serhii Bolvinov said some of the civilians died from bullet wounds and others passed away from explosive trauma, the result of artillery fire. This was a horrific discovery right on the back of the ghoulish graves found after the siege of Mariupol. According to the Ukrainians who spoke with the UN Human Rights Mission, Russian snipers positioned themselves on rooftops and shot randomly into crowds of civilians. Sadly, the siege resulted in the unlawful killing of roughly 300 innocent people. And as the aggression continues, more and more of these disturbing mass graves will be found throughout Ukraine. Bags of Body Parts In Mexico, police discovered 45 bags of body parts. The bags were found inside a ravine in the suburb of Guadalajara. The Jalisco police said the body parts matched the physical characteristics of missing people from a call center. Earlier this year, in May 2023, seven employees at a call center in Guadalajara were reported missing. But now, their individual body parts have been found in bags. Forensic experts are currently struggling to piece together how many victims the body parts belong to so they can notify the families that their loved ones were chopped into pieces. Since 2018, around 1,500 bodies have been discovered in the state of Jalisco. That's a terrifying number of people who have been picked off the street and murdered. Normally, the cops will find one or two bodies, but 45 bags of limbs in a 40-foot ravine is something far less typical. The police had to climb down into the ravine and pick through the nooks and crannies of rocks for black garbage bags stained with blood. It was utterly disturbing. The Plague Pit In London, construction workers uncovered 40 bodies in a mass burial pit. The laborers were completing work on the Elizabeth Line, underneath Liverpool Street Station, when they came across the Pit of the Dead. They think the mass grave was made in the 16th century, during an outbreak of the Black Plague. The bodies were found heaped on top of one another. However, they may have initially been buried in wooden coffins. The wood of the coffins rotted a long time ago, leaving the skeletons melded together in a blackened pile of bones. The area in which the plague pit was found was one of the first burial grounds that wasn't associated with a church. It was just some place where bodies could be easily disposed of and quickly without worrying about church rites. The leader of the excavation from the Museum of London Archaeology, Michael Henderson, insisted the bodies posed no risk to society. Although the plague is still around today, Londoners won't be getting infected from the exposed carcasses. The truth is that once a body is buried, the infectious disease dies quickly. The only way you could catch the plague from a corpse is if you were doing some grave robbing of a fresh victim 400 years ago but there are no bacteria that can jump from the bones to a living host. There is no exact figure for how many people died of the plague in London. The number of victims is believed to be in the millions, but it's impossible to say just how many. The victims in this particular plague pit died prior to one of the greatest outbreaks London had ever seen. The Black Death crept up in 1348 AD, when it initially killed nearly half of Europe. Then, the 1665 Great Plague of London wiped out about 15% of the city's population, and at its peak, around 7,000 people were dying every day. Rats carried disease fleas throughout the city, thriving on waste, filth, and sewage. And with bodies piling up, it offered even more food for the rats to procreate and for the fleas to spread. The 40 bodies just found in the plague pit likely died in an unrelated outbreak, one that may have led up to the 1665 disaster. The Missing Climber The body of a hiker was recently discovered on a melting glacier near the Matterhorn in the Swiss Alps. Police confirmed the hiker went missing almost 40 years ago. 
The man's icy corpse was found by a couple of climbers in July 2023 while they were scaling the Theodule Glacier in southern Switzerland. The glacier is melting so rapidly that it revealed the dead climber for the first time since 1986. The two hikers came across a boot sticking out of the melting ice, as well as a crampon, and this led to the excavation of the body and the revelation of a rather disturbing story. In September 1986, the German hiker was 38 years old. He was reported missing after several days when he failed to return from a solo hike. While the police didn't provide any ghoulish details about the circumstances of his death, they did publish a picture of the site. The picture shows a single hiking boot sticking out from the snow with red laces. It's safe to assume that something went terribly wrong during his ascent, causing him to be buried by falling snow and accumulating ice. If it weren't for the fact that glaciers are melting so quickly, the lost hiker may have remained in his icy prison forever. Unfortunately for the Swiss Alps, though, the glaciers have lost over half their volume since 1931. And considering around 300 people have gone missing in the area over the past 100 years, bodies are almost definitely going to start appearing more frequently as they are freed from their icy graves. The Brain Worm Something terrifying was just discovered in a woman's brain. A 64-year-old woman from New South Wales in Australia admitted herself to the hospital in January 2021. For three weeks, she'd been suffering from serious abdominal pain. She had violent diarrhea, night sweats, a dry cough, and a burning fever. By 2022, her symptoms had gotten even worse. She slipped into depression and began forgetting things, so medical professionals completed an MRI scan of her brain, which revealed an unknown anomaly that would require surgery. But the surgeons could never have expected that they'd find a disgusting brain worm. Normally, neurosurgeons deal with brain infections. They don't have to pull worms out of people's brains. Dr. Sinana Yake called it a once-in-a-career discovery. The surgeons very carefully pulled the writhing worm from the patient's brain, still alive. It was a type of roundworm, but they weren't sure what kind. And in order to proceed with the best treatment for the patient, the doctor sent the worm to a laboratory that deals with parasites. Scientists there knew exactly what kind of worm it was, Ophidiscaris robertsi. It's a type of roundworm typically found in pythons, not humans. In fact, this was the first time in medical history that such a parasite was discovered in a human host. But how did it happen? The patient lives in an area where carpet pythons roam free. This is Australia, after all, home to every terrifying snake you can imagine. Although the woman had no direct contact with a python, the patient did collect native grasses that she used in cooking. The doctors and scientists who worked together on the worm issue came up with a plausible hypothesis. They think the python shed its parasites in the grass through its dung. Then the woman collected the grass, which came into contact with kitchen utensils. And from there, the parasite entered the woman's body and took root in her brain. Ew. Civil War Bones Colonial Williamsburg is hailed as the largest museum of U.S. history in the world. It's a living museum with 301 acres of restored buildings from the 18th century. But of course, it wasn't always a museum. The city was once the capital of the colony of Virginia. In 1699, Jamestown was abandoned as the capital of the colony, primarily because there was so much malaria on Jamestown Island. Plantation landowners donated several of their holdings to make room for a new state house. The town that grew around it became known as Williamsburg. Famous Americans like George Washington and Thomas Jefferson participated in the government here. And it was from Williamsburg that the seeds for the United States began to take root. Because of its history, it should come as no surprise that there are bodies buried beneath colonial Williamsburg. And just recently, scientists uncovered a totally new set of human remains. Jack Gary, the director of archaeology for the site, said the remains were found near the old powder magazine on Duke of Gloucester Street. Analysis of the bones shows they date back to the Civil War. The old powder magazine was used for storing guns and ammunition in the 18th century. Archaeologists were trying to restore it to its former glory when they stumbled upon the human bones. It's believed the corpses were forgotten from the 1862 Battle of Williamsburg. Unfortunately, though, they've been in the ground too long to be identifiable. 
According to what Jack says, nobody knows if they were Union soldiers or Confederate soldiers. They may have even been unlucky civilians who got caught in the crossfire. Jack also said there's a lot that isn't known about Williamsburg. Researchers believe there could be a significant amount of dead people hidden near the powder magazine. The thing about the Civil War was that a lot of the dead were dumped into mass graves, put there with the intent of being removed later. The dead would be piled up, then when the fighting was over, they'd be dragged to a churchyard and properly buried. But sometimes people forgot, and mass graves were lost to history. So that could be the case in Williamsburg. The Forbidden Trail just earlier this year, a young 18-year-old hiker went missing from a trail. Now, the haunting last photo of the hiker has been released. The picture shows fearless young man Dalen Mokepua climbing the stairway to heaven. It was the last picture taken of Dalen before he went over the ridge and was never seen again. Let's start from the beginning. In 2023, Dalen was visiting his grandmother in Hawaii when he decided to go for a hike but he didn't want to hike any ordinary trail, so he went up the Stairway to Heaven, which is also called the Haiku Stairs. It's an extremely dangerous hiking route that closed in 1987. And you know it must be dangerous if it was shut down almost 40 years ago, back when there were hardly any safety regulations. The hiking trail is roughly 4,000 feet long, with 3,922 rickety stairs. The issue is that it's extremely narrow, with less than two feet of space in some parts. A single misplaced foot can result in a drop of 2,000 feet to certain doom on the rocks below. Even though it's illegal to hike the Stairway to Heaven, Dalen posted pictures of his adventures on social media. But then came the last picture, and Dalen was never seen again. Despite a desperate search attempt, rescuers couldn't locate his body. Then, after search and rescue operators gave up, a pair of hikers in the area reported hearing someone crying for help. They heard the cries but couldn't find where they were coming from. The team of volunteers went searching again, but Dalen was nowhere to be seen. The search was then called off in March. With the release of his final photo, people started noticing something strange. In the last picture Dalen took, which seemingly shows nothing but trees along the trail, there is an eerie figure. It looks like he wasn't alone on the stairway to heaven. In the photograph, you can clearly see a man squatting behind a bush, looking as if he's hiding. Could this man have been following Dalen, waiting to strike? Is that why his body was never discovered? Right now, authorities would really like to know who the mystery man in the photo is. The body in the freezer A woman's body was discovered in a freezer at an Arby's restaurant in Louisiana. That's a tough sentence to digest, but it gets even more horrifying when you learn that the 63-year-old temporary manager was discovered by her own son. He opened the freezer on May 11, 2023 to find his mother, Nguyet Le, cold and lifeless. The inside of the door was covered in blood from where the woman beat at the metal to try and escape. She must have given it all she had, but it was no use. There was nobody to hear her banging on the door. So, she collapsed onto the ground. Then, she curled into the fetal position and slowly froze to death. The autopsy showed she died from hypothermia. It looks like it was an accident, but still, the family blames the restaurant for poor management and maintenance. The family has already filed a lawsuit, claiming the freezer had been broken since August 2022. Employees had to use a screwdriver to open and close the door, which resulted in Nguyet Le getting stuck inside. The gruesome beach thing Something scary was found on a popular beach in Queensland in July 2023. Bobby Lee Oates was taking a stroll along Keppel Sands when he came across the skeletal remains of an alien-like creature. The corpse looked like a bizarre mix between a human, a whale, and a mermaid. Bobby Lee was so disturbed that he took a photograph and uploaded it onto a marine biology Facebook group. He was hoping someone on there would solve the mystery. But even people in the group didn't know what the thing was. They said it definitely looked creepy, but its anatomy didn't really make sense to them. The skull and ribs looked way too human for the entity to be a marine creature. But Professor Helene Marsh from James Cook University finally came to the rescue. Helene said it was likely a seal or some other decomposed marine mammal. But not everybody was convinced. The creature seemed to have legs, which seals definitely don't have. The whole thing was a weird mystery. 
one that's since been swept away by the tide. Unfortunately, the truth of the gruesome beach monster will likely never be solved. What do you think the ugly beach thing was? A dead mermaid or a dead seal? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Hand of God Near Hadrian's Wall in England at the old Roman fort Vindolanda, archaeologists made an intriguing discovery. An incredibly detailed miniature human hand made from 2.3 kilos of solid bronze. The ancient Romans called this the Hand of God and it was likely linked to the religious practices of the cult of Jupiter Dolichinus. While popular among Roman army men in the 3rd century AD, this cult's practices remain quite mysterious. The hand is creepy enough on its own, but its story is even more menacing. The bronze hand was probably left by the Romans as tribute to their god of war for leading them to victory during one of the bloodiest invasions in British history. Around 210 AD, the Romans invaded Scotland, killing thousands along the way. The Romans claimed that the local Scottish chieftains had gone back on a peace agreement, leading them to engage in a particularly bloody and nefarious campaign of terror. With a force of 50,000 led by the emperor himself, Septimius Severus, it was clear that he was pretty angry. The goal? Total annihilation. This bronze hand would be mounted at the top of a pole and was used to bless Jupiter's followers during religious rituals. The regiment based at Vindolanda was most likely very devout to this cult of Jupiter, as it was the only place where the temple was located inside the fort rather than nearby. This bronze hand, while already a bit strange to find buried in the ground, is a symbol of the brutal and violent nature of Roman military campaigns. Not a very nice piece of decor. The bronze hand can be seen at the Vindolanda Museum. Knife Hand In Veneto, northern Italy, archaeologists have uncovered a medieval skeleton with a knife for a hand. Found in a Langobard early medieval necropolis dating back around 1500 years, archaeologists have found a number of shocking things, including hundreds of human skeletons, two greyhounds, and a headless horse. But this disconcerting discovery stands out. The man's right forearm and hand had been amputated, and he then decided to go through life with a weapon instead of just a stump. Archaeologists estimated that he was around 40 to 50 years old and had lost his arm due to blunt force trauma, but the nature of this trauma is difficult to say. Life was extremely tough back then, and if he chose to have a knife as a prosthesis, it's clear that he thought it was necessary. The researchers believe it may have been removed for medical reasons or lost in battle. The Longobards were famous for their military fearlessness and warfare skills. Anything could have happened, but the aftereffects of this removal are clear through deeper analysis. The bones were reshaped by the prosthesis which the man would tie on with his teeth. The knife was held into place with a cap, leather straps, and a buckle which he would then pull into place. His teeth on the right side of his mouth displayed a lot of wear and tear, and his right shoulder joint was reoriented in an abnormal way, indicating that he used his mouth constantly to pull it into place. Surviving losing a limb without anesthesia or sterilization 1500 years ago seems like an almost impossible task. Unearthing ancient skeletons is chilling enough, but when they have knives for hands? Seems like he was ready to battle the walking dead. Vampire Burials Tales of the dead coming back to life have been around for thousands of years, and the real fear of vampires in Eastern Europe was exacerbated during times of crisis such as the plague and other diseases that were infectious and caused people to die quickly. People did not understand the process of decomposition, so the explanation for swelling bodies and gaping mouths? Vampires. In Poland during the 17th to 18th centuries, archaeologists have found cemeteries where people were sometimes buried with certain preventative measures, such as sickles around their necks or rocks placed under their jaws to prevent them from coming back to life, just in case. If someone became a vampire and tried to rise from the grave, the sickle would cut their neck and the rocks would keep their jaws shut so they would not be able to feed on the living. But that superstition doesn't make the remains any less jarring. By performing bone analysis, researchers found out that these vampires were not immigrants, but locals to the region. None of the bodies showed evidence of trauma or violence. This led these scientists to conclude that these unlucky souls were likely some of the first to fall to a cholera epidemic in the region. All of these bodies likely left others in the area weary of the dead coming back to life, and they thus became determined to stop that in a disturbing way. The so-called Vampire of Venice is one of the most striking of them all. Uncovered in a mass grave from the Dravsko Cemetery, the skull shows a brick lodged directly into its gaping jaw. Bones in Tree If you've ever watched Bones, then you might be familiar with this one. 
In one episode, the characters discover a skeleton permeated within the wood of a growing tree. Seems weird, right? But actually, quite realistic. During some intense winter storms in Ireland in 2015, a large beech tree fell over, ripping its roots from the ground and revealing a skeleton hidden underneath. It wasn't a recent crime, but a spooky discovery nonetheless. Researchers determined that this skeleton belonged to a medieval boy between 17 to 20 years old. Who knows who he was or how he came to be here, but it appeared that this boy had been attacked with multiple injuries to his ribs, probably inflicted by a knife. Someone had cared about him as he had been given a formal Christian burial, but after so long, the tree had grown around his remains, and when it was pulled from the ground, it took half of the skeleton with it. Researchers are now trying to discover more about this mysterious boy who died 1,000 years ago. Hopefully you won't find anything like this when you're out for a relaxing walk in the woods. The Fumes of Hell 2,000 years ago, an army of Persians were fighting for control of the Roman-held city of Dura, located in Syria. The Persians were digging tunnels to sneak up on the Romans, and the Romans did the same in return. However, archaeologists have now discovered the remains of 20 soldiers inside the siege tunnels of Dura who look like they died from inhaling toxic fumes. One of the soldiers had his armor pulled up around his chest. It looks like he was trying to pull it off as he died. The Persians used the tunnels to start toxic underground fires to melt the Romans' lungs. Archaeologist Simon James from the University of Leicester says that this gas would have been like the fumes of hell. These tunnels have since been reburied, but the evidence gathered by archaeologists suggests that ancient warfare also included the use of toxic gas. Most notably, the sulfur and bitumen crystals found on site hints at this nasty end for the Romans. This type of warfare was already well established by the time the Persians came around to Dura. One of the earliest examples is in 189 BC, when the Greeks burnt chicken feathers and blew the smoke into invading Romans tunnels too. Ancient armies were very creative, and historians are quick to point out that people don't realize how often these types of methods were used in the ancient world. Crushed Man The archaeological site of Pompeii has a large concentration of unsettling discoveries. The eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD leveled the city under volcanic ash, leaving it frozen in time. The recent discovery of a skeleton seemingly crushed by gigantic stone while fleeing represents the completely chaotic and tragic situation. Archaeologists discovered this skeleton spread eagle underneath a huge mound of stone directly on top of the man's head. Some scientists think that the stone was a door jam thrown with great force by the volcanic eruption. This block of stone then likely hit the man square on the head, crushing it in turn. The thing is, his head was missing. The skeleton also shows signs of a leg infection, which could have made it harder for this man to escape. However, after the discovery of his skeleton, archaeologists located the skull nearby, negating the theory that the man was crushed by the stone block. While his fate remains the same, it is more likely that he died from asphyxiation from the deadly gases and ash emitted by the volcano. The last thing he would have seen as he looked up at the volcano is a big black cloud billowing down towards him. Underground Death Labyrinth Recent archaeological discoveries show that something quite unnerving was going on below the Chavin de Huantar, a 3,000-year-old Peruvian temple. New technological advances helped researchers look through the tunnels underneath the temple, where they found the remains of three skeletons, thought to have been sacrificed to the gods as they were found face down. Historians think that this temple was active between 1200 to 200 BC. Now archaeologists have discovered 35 tunnels beneath the temple with the help of robots. The robots, designed by Stanford engineers, are tiny remote-controlled vehicles with attached cameras and lights. In addition to the skeleton, these robots also uncovered ceramics and tools. The skeletons belong to a boy, a teenager, and a young man, but it is the nature of these deaths that is most troubling. Researchers say that these priests of the temple executed these sacrifices possibly using drugs, noise, and light manipulation. This would make it seem as if the leaders of Chavin had higher spiritual powers, invoking mystique and fear. The people and things found at the temple reveal a dark world underground with many clues for us about the past. Aztec Whistle We all know that the Aztecs were friendly to the idea of sacrifice. In fact, they were friendly to a number of frightening practices, and their skull decor was no less spooky. It seems that they were surrounded by death and battle in all aspects of their life, and their musical tastes made everything scarier. The Aztec death whistle makes the most frightening sound in the world. Meant to sound like a shriek of terror, it is likely that hundreds of these would be used in battle to intimidate the enemy. Listen to it and tell me what you think. 
Now imagine hundreds of them at the same time and tell me that it is not the creepiest thing that you've ever heard. While there is no solid evidence as to what they were used for, they definitely played a role in sacrifice, as a 20-year-old sacrificial victim was found clutching this skeleton whistle in his hands. It took many years for archaeologists to discover that it was an actual instrument that made noise. Knowing the Aztecs, they could have been used to strike fear into their enemies' hearts. Others have suggested that they could have been part of their healing rituals, and some have even described it as therapeutic. But the most probable use for these instruments of death was in some connection to death. The Spanish described the Aztecs in battle as making sounds from hell itself. And after hearing this whistle, that makes sense. You can get one of these whistles for yourself if you are so inclined, and if you're dead set on scaring anything and everything away from you. Anthropodermic Bibliopegy What does this even mean? It means books found in actual human skin. Scientists at Harvard University recently revealed that they had found one of these books in their library. And even creepier, this practice is not as uncommon as you might think. While there aren't a bunch, there are some floating around. Termed anthropodermic bibliopegy, many people have apparently bound certain volumes with human skin throughout history. In the 16th to 19th centuries, books were sometimes bound with the skin of soldiers, criminals, and the terminally ill. Thus far, the Anthropodermic Book Project has in its possession 47 books that are suspected to be skin-bound, although only 18 are confirmed. The others are maybe bound with the skin of animals. You know, 50-50 chance. The barbarity of some ancient artifacts seems far away from our contemporary inclinations, but these skin-bound books are a little too close for comfort. You might have one on your shelf. You can even go see some at the Surgeon's Hall Museum in Scotland, the Musée Carnavalet in Paris, or the Muter Museum in Philadelphia. Artificial Cranial Deformation In 1928, archaeologists found a 2,000-year-old graveyard in the Pisco province with bizarre skeletons, with the largest elongated skulls found anywhere in the world. These large, elongated skulls have always interested conspiracy theorists who draw parallels between these skulls and those of aliens. Recreations of what the people with these skulls would have looked like aren't nice to look at either. However, in 2014, these skulls gained a lot of attention as they were supposedly analyzed by scientists who could not determine if their DNA was human. To put these rumors to rest, more recent testing done in three different laboratories in Canada and the US confirmed that they were from an ancient human culture. But more interestingly, they were found to have European and Middle Eastern DNA, raising the question of when people traveled from Eurasia to the Americas, as these skeletons are around two to 3,000 years old. Cranial deformation is found in many cultures around the world and is not shockingly unique, but the ones found in Paracas are the longest. The reason for the procedure can only be guessed at with some scientists suggesting it was used to show wealth, social status, or tribal affiliation. The act of cranial deformation has proven to not reduce cognitive ability, despite what it may look like. Regardless, it is still quite shocking to see and has amazed ancient historians and modern researchers alike. The Edinburgh Vaults It is said that there are very few places in the world as haunted as Scotland's Edinburgh Vaults. They were dark and grungy places full of thieves and murderers. It was one of the most dangerous places in the city, and based on many reports, it seems that their ghosts are still around. Located in the 19 arches of Southbridge in Edinburgh, Scotland, the Edinburgh vaults are a series of chambers dating back to 1788. For a short time, the vaults were used as intended, as storage spaces and workshops for businesses operating out of Southbridge. The vaults soon began to leak and flood because the bridge was never waterproofed, courtesy of rushed, flawed construction and budgetary constraints. So businesses began abandoning them in 1795, pretty soon. Poor people and ill-reputed business operators took over the vaults, using them as living spaces and running pubs and brothels out of them. But this was no place to raise a family or even to carry out one's dirty deeds. Crime proliferated and these damp, crowded spaces, which often housed families of 10 or more to a single room, continued to rapidly deteriorate. They not only continued leaking, but were unsanitary and unventilated with little light, air, or heat. The vaults were permanently abandoned within 30 years of the Southbridge's completion. To deter future squatters from taking up residence, they were filled in with rubble and eventually forgotten about. During the 1980s, Nori Rowan, a Scottish former rugby player, was on a quest to help another rugby player and Romanian defector Christian Raducanu escape the Romanian secret police and obtain political asylum. While exploring a tunnel, he rediscovered the vaults. 
Rowan and his son excavated the vaults during the 1990s, removing hundreds of tons of rubble by hand. While little official documentation exists to describe the day-to-day -day lives of the tenement residents, artifacts like old toys, medicine bottles, horseshoes, clay pipes, buttons, diningware, and other household items help to tell their story. You can tour them today, and while it's disturbing enough to imagine someone living in such dismal conditions, you can see why they seem haunted. For especially brave or crazy souls, ghost tours are available, and the vaults are open to the public overnight every Thursday, Friday, and Saturday throughout the month of August during the Edinburgh Festival Fringe. A morbid keepsake. In 2014, archaeologists with France's National Institute for Preventive Archaeological Research discovered five embalmed human hearts in heart-shaped lead urns buried in a cemetery in the northwestern city of Rennes. One of the hearts was found in an airtight lead coffin along with the remarkably well-preserved remains of an aristocratic widow named Louise de Kengo, who passed away in 1656 at age 65 or older. An inscription on the vessel containing her husband, Toussaint Perrien's heart, helped researchers identify her. While the heart-in-a-box concept may seem strange to you or me, it was considered perfectly normal 360 years ago. It was common during that time period to be buried with the heart of a husband or a wife, Dr. Fatima Zora Mokrain, who led an in-depth study of the five hearts, said in a statement. It's a very romantic aspect to the burials. What do you think? Do you want to be buried with your lover's heart? Using MRI and CT technology, Mokrain and her colleagues examined the other four hearts, which they also found in the graves of elite families. They were so well preserved, the team detected signs of heart problems like plaque and atherosclerosis, although they didn't say whether these conditions contributed to the individual's deaths. Cursed money. In August 2011, an unemployed 51 year old carpenter named Wayne Sabaj discovered $150,000 in cash in the garden of his Illinois home while he was picking broccoli. Nice. But of course, there's a catch. Somehow his neighbor found out about it. Maybe he told her, I guess? Sabaja's neighbor, Dolores Johnson, was an 87-year-old woman with dementia. She insisted the cash was cursed and allegedly told her daughter that she had placed it in bags and buried it for that reason. Her daughter filed a claim on her behalf for the money, but Johnson never saw her day in court because she passed away before the matter was settled. Sabaj had turned his discovery over to authorities, worried that it might have been drug money. It was found inside two nylon string bags with smaller bags and money paper clipped together. A judge planned to split the money between Sabaj and Johnson's daughter, but Sabaj succumbed to diabetes-related complications a little over a week before the scheduled court date. When his father learned of the tragedy, he was hospitalized for cardiac arrest. Apparently, Dolores had been right all along. The money seemed cursed. It was never linked to any crime and nobody has been able to prove where the money came from or if it was cursed. But considering its tragic legacy, it's hard to say what will happen next. Even the lawyer is not sure if he wants to take a fee. Unicorn Lair North Korea's primary media outlet, the Korean Central News Agency, reported back in 2012 that archaeologists had reconfirmed the existence of a unicorn's lair. Reportedly, the unicorn lair had been found 656 feet from a temple in Pyongyang, the capital city. The fabled lair allegedly once belonged to a unicorn ridden by the ancient King Tong Myong. Starting in the 3rd century BC, King Tong Myong ruled over a kingdom that occupied the Korean peninsula and parts of China, and which lasted until sometime during the 7th century. The alleged news report, which credited researchers from the Academy of Social Sciences at North Korea's History Institute with the discovery, claimed that a rectangular rock carved with the word Unicorn Lair stands in front of the lair, just so you don't miss it. The carved words are believed to date back to the period of the Koryo Kingdom from 918 to 1392. Supernatural claims regarding the Kim family abound, and the fact that North Korea was home to the mythical unicorn is an important claim to the Korean peninsula. As ridiculous as this report seems on its own, the claim's timing made the matter even more bizarre. Just days before this claim made headlines, China's Communist Party newspaper mistakenly praised The Onion for naming the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un the sexiest man alive, not realizing that the article was satire. Whoops. These types of myths are becoming less common as information is now more available within the country that is also accessible to outsiders. Hey, we found out about it. Fat bird. Workers from the Southwest Water Company, which manages sewers throughout England, were perplexed when a 210-foot-long fatberg was discovered beneath Sidmouth, England, a small seaside town of around 13,000 residents. 
Curious to understand how such a large blockage formed in such a quiet, sparsely populated area, they had a team of 10 scientists perform an autopsy on the mass. But first, what exactly is a fatberg? Put simply, a fatberg is a mass of fats and other solid waste that accumulates in a sewer, usually, but not always, in large cities like London and New York, for example. Once they got past the putrid stench, the team dissected the foul wad of waste and discovered that it was made of far safer materials than they had imagined. We were all surprised to find that this Sidmouth fatberg was simply a lump of fat aggregated with wet wipes, sanitary towels, and other household products that really should be put in the bin and not down the toilet. John Love, a professor of synthetic biology at the University of Exeter and the study's leader, said in a statement. In September 2017, workers spent three weeks unclogging a Whitechapel sewer of the largest known fatberg in British history. In a BBC interview, Alex Saunders of Thames Water explained, a fatberg smells like rotting meat mixed with the odor of a smelly toilet. I think I'll take his word for it. Ancient Home Burials In late March of this year, archaeologists solved a long-standing mystery with their discovery of human remains inside ancient homes at the Neolithic Çatalhöyük settlement in Turkey. The 9,000-year-old site, which was inhabited from 7500 BC until 5700 BC, and which was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 2012, has long hosted archaeologists. And until recently, experts wondered how residents of Çatalhöyük buried their deceased. These findings suggest that at least some people were interred right at home. Researchers have long known that people were buried in shallow graves, which were sometimes reopened and added to, and then plastered over, but they were unsure whether residents were buried at home or in larger communal graves. Archaeologist Katarzyna Harabaz may have solved this puzzle when she examined the soot-covered remains of a woman who died between ages 30 and 35 from respiratory failure. The woman was found in a house that showed evidence of poor ventilation, leading Harabaz to conclude, based on her cause of death, that she was buried at home. This intriguing find brings archaeologists one step closer to their broader goal of understanding how day-to-day -day life functioned in the city thousands of years ago. Not an easy task. A creepy cinema. In Paris in 2004, police announced the discovery of a subterranean cinema beneath the city's 16th arrondissement. Officers from the Sports Squad, which patrols Paris's 170-mile network of underground caves, tunnels, and catacombs, found the mysterious makeshift movie theater during a training exercise. They entered the network through a drain pipe and were met by a tarp bearing the words, Building Site, No Access. Stationed behind the tarp was a desk and a surveillance camera, which captured images of anyone who passed by. Even more disturbingly, unwelcome visitors triggered a tape recording of barking dogs to play, which was presumably intended to scare them away. The entrance led to an amphitheater situated 60 feet underground, with seating and terraces cut into the rock. It was equipped with three phone lines, professionally installed electricity, and a full-size screen, along with various films, including vintage classics and more recent works. While the unknown patrons of this theater liked variety, none of the films were banned or controversial, as you'd probably expect of a secret viewing facility. Next door, inside a smaller cave, was a bar and restaurant. Police admitted that they had no idea who the cinema belonged to, but they noticed various symbols painted on the ceiling, including Stars of David and Celtic crosses, suggesting that a secret society or club of some sort may have used the space. Three days later, law enforcement returned to the site only to find a note in the middle of the floor stating, Do not try to find us. Creepy, right? Bog butter. Would you eat centuries-old butter? Me neither, but people do unintentionally stumble across it sometimes in Ireland and Scotland, usually while they're digging up peat to heat their houses with. Known as bog butter, this substance is typically either made from cow's milk or beef tallow. People buried it in peat bogs inside wooden containers or earthenware pots or wrapped in animal skins, and they apparently sometimes forgot about it, leaving a rank surprise for an unsuspecting individual to discover hundreds of years, and in some cases, millennia later. While bog butter often retains a similar texture and aroma to the butter we commonly use today, it can also have what archaeologist Andrew Zimmern referred to as a pungent and slightly offensive odor. Zimmern was crazy enough to sample some bog butter and discovered the taste as having a lot of funk and a crazy moldy finish. Would you try this? I don't think I'm brave enough. With their low oxygen content, high acidity, and cool temperatures, bogs were ideal for preserving butter and other perishable items. 
But some experts believe people buried their bog butter as an offering to the gods or to prevent thieves from finding and taking it. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. International Smuggle Tunnels There are so many tunnels between the US and Mexico that there are actually special task forces to find them. In March of this year, the San Diego Tunnel Task Force announced their discovery of a sophisticated international drug smuggling tunnel linking a warehouse in Tijuana, Mexico to a warehouse in the San Diego neighborhood of Ote Mesa. Federal agents discovered the 2,000-foot-long passage as part of an investigation into suspected narcotic smuggling targeting a transnational crime ring. The tunnel, which measures 3 feet wide and sits 31 feet underground, doesn't seem very spectacular at first glance, but it was well-built and was equipped with lighting, ventilation, reinforced walls, and an underground rail system. While executing a warrant, the task force seized copious amounts of illicit substances, including 1,300 pounds of cocaine, a ton and a half of marijuana, 86 pounds of methamphetamine, and more, with an estimated total value of $29.6 million. The San Diego Tunnel Task Force seems to be having a good year so far. Just months earlier, following a multi-year, multi-agency investigation, authorities uncovered the longest illicit transnational tunnel ever found along the southwestern U.S. border. The five-and-a-half-foot-tall, two-foot-wide, 70-foot-deep tunnel extends for 4,309 feet, or roughly three-quarters of a mile, from Tijuana to San Diego. It had rail and drainage systems, ventilation, and even an elevator. Mummified Lung in Paris in 1959, archaeologist Michael Fleury uncovered an oddly preserved lung from a stone sarcophagus in the Basilica of Saint Denis, where French kings were buried for hundreds of years. Along with the lung were a skeleton, some hair, jewelry, and textile and leather fragments. The remains belonged to the Merovingian Queen Arnegund, one of King Clotaire's I's six wives. She lived from around 515 to 580 AD. During the 1960s, Arnegun's body vanished, and it did not reappear until 2003. Modern researchers were perplexed about whether her lung was naturally mummified or if someone had purposely preserved it. Bioanthropologist Raffaella Bianucci of the University of Turin told Discovery News that the lung appears nicely preserved, while the body is completely skeletonized. In 2015, an investigative team led by Bianucci performed biopsies on the lung and discovered a heavy concentration of copper ion and copper oxide. Arnegund was buried wearing a copper alloy belt around her waist, leading the team to believe that the belt's deterioration preserved her lung. Weird, huh? Vampire of Venice In 2009, archaeologists revealed the discovery of the remains of a female vampire in a 16th century mass grave of plague victims near Venice, Italy. Originally found in 2006 on the Venetian island of Lazaretto Nuovo, a brick was jammed into the woman's jaw, forcing her mouth open. Archaeologists were pretty shocked. They had heard stories of this type of thing, but there had never been such blatant proof. This was an exorcism technique that was practiced on suspected vampires in Europe at the time. It was the first ever discovery of human remains that appeared to represent an alleged vampire. A few years before being found, forensic archaeologist Matteo Barini from the University of Florence led a study to learn more about the woman's identity, why she was suspected of being a vampire, and what she looked like. They determined that the woman was between 61 and 71 years old. She ate mostly vegetables and grains, indicating that she was probably lower class and likely lived a rather ordinary life. Her age was rather shocking, as most European women during the Middle Ages didn't live nearly that long. At the time, many people believed strongly in vampires. This notion was partially fueled by a dark fluid that flowed from the nose and mouth of corpses during the decomposition process. When gravediggers reopened mass burials to add the bodies of newly deceased plague sufferers, they may have mistaken this fluid as the blood of vampire victims. Burial shrouds sometimes became soaked with the fluid and sank into the mouths of dead bodies, making them appear as if they had chewed on the cloth. Soon enough, vampires were blamed for causing the plague. By inserting objects into corpses' mouths, people believed that it stopped the spread of the deadly disease and would prevent vampires from being able to eat. Since the Vampire of Venice was discovered, others have been found, including one that was unearthed in Poland in 2014. While vampires are not real per se, you can imagine how discovering decomposing bodies hundreds of years ago would have been pretty spooky, especially if you knew nothing about science or biology. Back then, vampires were real. Books bound in human skin 
In 2014, scientists determined that a book found in Harvard called Destinies of the Soul was bound in human skin. The study concluded that the literary work was likely covered with the flesh of an unidentified female mental patient who died of natural causes. Written by French novelist Arsène Hossayer, the book ended up in the hands of the author's friend, Dr. Ludovic Boland, during the 1880s. Um, I don't know about you, but this is not the type of gift that I want. Dr. Boulam proceeded to bind the book in human skin, a process known as anthropodermic bibliopegy, which dates as far back as the 19th century, and likely before then. I guess I just don't appreciate this type of hobby, but there are three books made of skin found in libraries at Harvard alone. Another example of a book bound with a person's flesh is owned by the Bristol Record Office and is covered in the skin of 18-year-old John Horwood, the first man to be hanged at Bristol Jail. The disturbing work contains details of Horwood's crime, the murder of a woman named Eliza Balsam. Infamous murderer William Burke's skin was used for binding a small brown pocketbook following his execution in 1829, and in a disturbing twist, is stamped with his death date. There are no pages contained within the appalling artifact, which would have been used for storing money and other personal effects, like a wallet. And how the man's skin came to be used for its manufacture remains a mystery to this day. There was a public dissection and it was reported that part of the skin went missing and then soon after this book turned up for sale in Edinburgh, Emma Black from the Royal College of Surgeons told the BBC. The production of this book followed a trend in which body parts of executed criminals were considered to be a type of talisman. Numerous other criminal skin was reportedly used for bookbinding, including that of George Cudmore, a rat catcher and murderer from Devon, England, who was hanged in 1830 after he was convicted of killing his wife. Cudmore's flesh was used to cover an 1852 copy of the poetical works of John Milton. The creepy literary work went on display in February 2011 at the West Country Studies Library in Exeter. Although public records confirm that Cudmore's body was dissected after his execution, how and why samples of his skin were kept long enough to bind a book remains an ongoing mystery. Quite clearly, someone held onto the biological material for several decades until they decided to engage in the uncommon, I guess yet not unusual practice of anthropodermic bibliopegy. Altamura Man The Altamura Man is a Neanderthal that had provided us with the oldest known Neanderthal DNA ever to be extracted. The poor man's skeletal remains were found in a limestone cave in Altamura, Italy, fused to the limestone walls, leaving a horrific skull emerging from the bumpy, crystallized wall. He appears to have fallen into a 26-foot sinkhole and most likely got severely hurt. Now stuck and alone, he is believed to have died from starvation between 128,000 and 187,000 years ago. Over the thousands of years, his bones became covered in calcite and fused with the cave wall. Because archaeologists believe that removing the remains would damage them, the complete skeleton remains at the site where it was discovered. Scientists extracted a bone fragment for analysis, which they used to obtain a DNA sample. In 2016, researchers reconstructed a highly realistic model of the Neanderthal's face and body. He was short, with a large nose, a protruding jawline, and an elongated cranium. While the individual's body was characteristic of other Neanderthal remains scientists have discovered, his head was shaped slightly differently. It shows archaic traits, making the Altamora man a sort of morphological bridge between the previous human species, Homo heidelbergensis, and the Neanderthals, said paleontologist Giorgio Manzi, who was part of the team that successfully extracted DNA from the skeleton. The Altamura man lived during the late middle to early late Pleistocene period, around 150,000 years ago, and Neanderthals existed between 200,000 and roughly 40,000 years ago. This unique skeleton is considered a regional treasure, and locals hope that it will be the key to scientific research and inspire the protection of their heritage and history. Mummified Lung in 1959, archaeologist Michael Fleury found a preserved lung inside a stone sarcophagus in the Basilica of Saint-Denis in Paris, the burial site of many French kings. Buried along with the lung were a skeleton, jewelry, textiles and leather fragments, and a strand of hair. But whose were they? The remains belonged to the Merovingian Queen Arnegund, one of King Clotaire's six wives and the mother of King Chilperic. She lived roughly between 515 and 580, and her burial was identified based on a gold ring bearing the inscription Arnegundis. 
Queen Arnegan's lung raised numerous questions that perplexed experts for decades, including whether it somehow mummified naturally or if it was deliberately embalmed. The fact that it was the only preserved part of her otherwise skeletonized body made the matter even more mysterious. In 2016, an international team of researchers led by bioanthropologist Raffaella Bianucci determined that the lung's remarkably preserved state likely results from a copper belt Arnegan's corpse wore when she was buried. The decayed belt deposited large concentrations of copper oxide throughout the lung, which the scientists detected during biopsies, and this had an embalming effect on the organ. They also determined that the queen's body was injected with a fluid made from a mixture of spices and aromatic plants, which also likely contributed to the lung's preservation. Murder Island Mass Grave In 1629, a Dutch merchant vessel called the Batavia ran aground on a small coral island roughly 37 miles off the Australian coast. Around 60 people out of the 341 souls aboard were lost in the wreck while another 280 or so sought refuge on Beacon Island, which has since been nicknamed Murder Island. As part of an effort to learn more about the circumstances surrounding the disaster, archaeologists discovered a communal grave containing the remains of five individuals on Murder Island in late 2017. This and other evidence shows that in the months following the Batavia's wreck, around 115 of the 280 survivors were murdered in a brutal mutiny. But the ship seemed doomed from the outset of its maiden voyage when it departed the Netherlands seeking spices from Indonesia, known as the Dutch East Indies at the time. It was one of seven vessels in a fleet, but it became separated from the convoy following a rough storm in the North Sea. At some point, a female passenger was assaulted, revealing the first signs of a possible mutiny. When the Batavia ran aground, its survivors sought shelter among several shallow islands. Sometime thereafter, the ship's third in command organized a mutiny of 40 men amid an increasingly scarce freshwater supply in an attempt to optimize their chances of survival. Merchant Geronimus Cornelis led the rebellion, commanding certain groups of people to seek resources on nearby islands, murdering others in a methodical and organized fashion. The communal grave that was discovered in 2017 appears to contain the remains of people who were laid to rest respectfully rather than hurriedly, suggesting that they were not victims of Cornelius's convoluted mutiny. Researchers theorize that they died shortly after the disaster and before the violence began. Experts hope to learn more about the deceased individuals through further analysis of their remains. Death Labyrinth While working at the 3,000-year-old Chavín de Huantar Temple in Peru in 2018, Scientists discovered a complex maze of underground tunnels, as well as three skeletons of humans who appeared to be killed during sacrifices. They made the fascinating find using tiny remote-controlled robots equipped with lights and cameras, which were designed by Stanford University engineers. Also included among the artifacts found in the tunnels are ceramic fragments and tools. Altogether, experts identified 35 interlocking tunnels dating back between 1200 and 200 BC. The human remains found inside were found to be those of a child, a teenager, and a young man between 20 and 30 years old. One of the skeletons was found face down, suggesting that the ill-fated individuals were perhaps sacrificed. John Rick, the project's director, said authorities and priests played with the architecture and carried out rituals with drugs, noise, and light manipulation that pilgrims could not explain and made them believe the leaders of Chavín had higher powers. The discovery was hailed as one of the most significant archaeological finds in the last half century. Cabayan Mummy Caves during the early 20th century, industrial loggers in the forest north of Manila, the capital city of the Philippines, discovered hundreds of coffins and human remains inside a series of ancient burial caves. The graves belong to the Ibaloy tribe, who experts believe interred the remains between the years 1200 and 1500. Shortly before someone passed away, they drank a salty concoction to begin the mummification process. Once the person passed, their body was cleansed, prepared with herbs, and heated over a several-week period. As part of this regimen, the deceased individual was set over a fire in a seated position while tobacco smoke was blown into their mouth to dry their internal organs. Then the corpse was situated in a fetal position inside a decoratively carved oval-shaped wooden coffin. This practice ended following the arrival of the Spanish in 1500, and the burials remained undisturbed until they were rediscovered in the early 1900s. 
They were designated a national cultural treasure, but very little protection was extended to the burials, and looting and vandalism became major issues, among other naturally caused problems, such as fungal growth and insect infestation. For these reasons, the government has avoided publishing the exact location of the tombs. People still manage to find them, but the journey to the site is arduous, requiring a five-hour drive into the mountains, followed by a five-hour hike up a series of stone steps. Locals continue to pay respect to the mummies via prepared meals, which help to ensure that the deceased are well-fed in the afterlife. Shrieking Death Whistles One of the arguably most terrifying sounds a person might hear is that of the Aztec Shrieking Death Whistle, which in the words of Ruben Westmas in a Discovery article, sounds like a screeching zombie. It is definitely a shriek of death. These creepy musical instruments may have been used for numerous purposes, including intimidation before or during battle, or perhaps for calling the gods for healing purposes and accompanying the dead into the afterlife. One thing archaeologists are sure of, however, is the fact that shrieking death whistles played a role in human sacrifices. During the 90s, researchers in Mexico discovered the 500-year-old decapitated remains of a sacrificial victim who clung to a death whistle in his skeletal hands. It wasn't until years later that an archaeologist decided to blow into this strange object that was housed on a shelf. It emitted a high-pitched, death-like scream. There are different air streams generated within the structure of these instruments, which then diametrically hits against each other, music archaeologist Arndt Adjiboth told Gizmodo, and thus the Aztecs were able to produce a very shrill and noisy sound. Imagine hundreds or even thousands of these screaming whistles sounding at once. The horrifying sound immediately captivates the imagination and takes you to a very dark place. Hundreds of Lost Sites Burned grass and dead crops are almost never a good thing, but a scorching heat wave that hit the UK and Ireland in 2018 revealed the presence of around 1,500 archaeological sites over a short, several-week span. The oldest among them date back roughly 5,000 years to the Neolithic period, while others are from as recent as the Tudor dynasty. Aerial archaeologists from historic England detected the sites by flying over them and identifying them among the heat-damaged landscape. Included among the discoveries are burial mounds, military structures, lost villages, ancient field boundaries, and a demolished Tudor hall and the outline of its intended replacement. Some of the sites were more recognizable than others, and some were downright perplexing or eerie. For example, one bizarre prehistoric settlement found in Cornwall is surrounded by concentric ditches, while a rare medieval cemetery was found in Wales, and other burial sites were discovered in Scotland and Ireland. So what's so scary about these newly found sites? For one, they all appeared very quickly and over a short time period. Secondly, they offer a glimpse into little-known parts of the region's past, including cemeteries, which are inherently creepy to begin with. Unfortunately, few of these sites will be excavated, but on the bright side, many are now protected from damaging activities such as deep plowing. Thanks for watching! Which discovery did you like the most? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. See you next time! Bye!